after a long, long time doing other things, I did end up coming back to the moon uh, and doing lunar studies, basically starting with Lunar Prospector. And uh, Bill Feldman uh, let me jump into that, and it's been a, an amazing ride ever since because we were looking at the moon with completely new eyes on Prospector, completely new eyes. Mapping the planet in, in gamma rays and neutrons to learn what the composition is, and it just raises new questions. What we realized as a result of those maps is that the Apollo sites, which kind of establish our ground truth in the, in the 60s and 70s, are really located very, very close together in a very narrow range of geochemistry. And outside of where the Apollo landing sites are is Terra or Luna Incognita, a lot of places that where the geochemistry and, by implication, the mineralogy is different than we've had, got samples for. And it's like, wow, you know, if we go back, there are going to be a lot of places that we can explore where the, the rocks and soils are going to be really different and they're going to be just as informative as the Apollo soils were. So there's a lot out there yet to, do, to uh, explore. The other realization uh, that came with Prospector was the recognition of, at the poles of increases in what we think was hydrogen, uh, which kind of segues us into the next chapter of lunar exploration uh, ushered in by LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, it's flying an exquisite instrument amongst many others, but on one exquisite instrument called the Diviner. Um, it's, a, it's an imaging radiometer in, for the thermal infrared, and it can actually see down to very, very, very cold temperatures and create maps and images of these very, very cold temperatures. And we realized, looking at those data, that lo and behold, the interiors of these craters near the poles are not just 100 Kelvin, which is really cold, not 80 Kelvin, like liquid nitrogen temperatures, but 30 Kelvin, 25 Kelvin. I mean, these are places that have been in shadow and cold for two billion years. The poles are really intriguing because we really don't know anything about them, except that they're cold, they're in permanent shadow, they appear to harbor hydrogenous and non-hydrogenous volatiles that have been captured over the history of the moons. It's a frontier that we have, we really don't have any exposure to at all for, from, from planetary exploration's point of view. So for my money, going back there to scratch the surface, maybe to ground truth the Elcross impact site, and to really verify and validate all the possible things that could be there lurking in the soil, uh, that, that would be huge for two reasons. Scientifically, it's extremely interesting. Um, it would tie down what, what kinds of volatiles, what kinds of chemicals have actually been delivered not just to the moon over the last few billion years, but also to the earth. The very early earth suffered the same kind of bombardment and had the same kind of delivery of in interesting exotic stuff to its surface. Could those things be prebiotic compounds and actually be responsible for providing the foundations for life on earth? I mean, I think that's a really intriguing notion, but that's all been wiped out on the Earth. I mean, the last, the first billion years of Earth's history is like this, this enigma. But, you know, that stuff is still preserved on the Moon. I mean, it's, so it's out there kind of standing there as a, a, like they always say, a Rosetta Stone, helping to inform us about that early history of the, of the inner solar system and what happened, what, what took place, what was delivered, how do we explain what we have today as a result of that. So the poles are really intriguing. The second reason the poles are really intriguing is that if, if the volatiles that are sequestered there are easy to get to and of great volume and, and basically uh, constitute an ore body, that becomes a resource you can use. And making use of in situ resources is always economically, as long as they're relatively um, easy to get to, always economically more viable for things like, you know, any kind of enterprise you want to do. You want to live somewhere, if you want to use it for space travel, it would be much cheaper to use, say, water on the moon for hydrogen and oxygen than it would be to haul it up out of Earth's gravity well. So it really offers you a, uh, the possibility of, of extending, you know, the economics of the Earth really way out beyond lunar distance. Temperatures are low enough so that something like ice can be sequestered there for billions and billions of years. So if long, long ago uh, some very large impact took place which kind of emplaced 
um, a polar cap, if you like, of, uh, or, or an extensive veneer all across the planet of um, volatile rich materials mixed in with regolith and mixed in with the impactor materials. Uh, some of that's going to be already kind of um, protected by the uh, regolith, the dry regolith that it's mixed in with. You, you might lose the surface veneer because of the high temperatures eventually. But the stuff that actually ended up in cold traps and if it's covered so that it's not, it's not uh, boiled away by lime and alpha or something like that. So if it has a thin, a thin uh, layer of protective material, again, in the coal traps, it'll, it'll just stay there forever and ever and ever. Okay, but there's four and a half billion years of, of lunar history, right? So a lot of things could have taken place in, in that time. Um, so one of them is that if you had a large impact such as that, and then you, and, and subsequent to that, you had um, continued gardening so that you now built up a layer of fairly dry regolith over a billion years of, of about a meter or so, over two billion years, another, another meter, two meters total. Down below that could still be really interesting, uh, volatile rich stuff in place long, long ago. And we'd never see it with neutron spectroscopy from Lunar Prospector. We'd never see it from Diviner. It's too deep. I mean, we couldn't, the only way we're going to see it, the only way we're going to really get ground truth on that particular question is to go there and excavate, drill or, or trench or something. But, you know, drilling is, is the obvious way to go about it. There might be a treasure trove even greater than we imagine based on what we know currently today is within the top meter. It's just, it's just you know, a meter, <laughs> a meter at the poles of the moon is like the thinnest skin you can possibly imagine. What is beneath that? There's, a, there's billions of years of gardening beneath that, and we just don't know. We simply, and we won't know with anything from lunar orbit. So really, you'd like to go there and take a core sample? Like Absolutely, take a core sample in the polar regions. We have core samples from Apollo at the lower latitudes, and those, you know, it's a completely different environment. Going to the moon, back to the, to the poles for the first time with a landed mission, it's going to be a completely different world for us. It's going to be like a new moon, a completely different moon than we're used to based on Apollo and, and any robotic exploration from, from the lower latitudes. It's just, it's really Luna incognita. So you go to lunar poles, you're in a completely different regime and you really have to do the design right to be able to survive and operate. Um, I think that's a re it's a technological challenge it's a, a it's an exploration challenge. The environment is very very challenging, um, but the payoff is potentially huge because uncovering what's there, understanding what's there, how it got there, how much of it is there, and opening the door to a whole new way of doing space flight in the solar system by using resources that you find there. It's hard to beat that. <laughs>